chapter 13 from Brennan LeMay uh, talking about solutions. So going back, uh, this is the first chapter in 1412. Uh, going back to 1311, uh, uh, at the very end of that course, we did uh, chapter 10, which was gases, and then we did solutions, uh, which we, we, we at least started solutions, which was uh, chapter 11. Uh, where we were talking about, well, not, not really solutions, but uh, <clears throat> the vapor phase of uh, liquids. So chapter 10 was gases, and the chapter 11 kind of took that a, a little further and talked about what happens when you have like water and when you boil it. <clears throat> we talked about uh, the relationship between the vapor pressure of water and also um, the pressure uh, and also the temperature. So now in this first chapter in 1412 we're going to talk about um what's uh, happening when we put something in the water or whatever whatever the liquid is and that's called the solution so <clears throat> as always let me start off with giving the credits here so uh, a lot of the materials here are either going to come from zumdahl's original powerpoints that they give out or also brennan lemay's <clears throat> and i've taken those and i've built on them um, so, uh, a lot of what you'll see on the slides in, in these presentations will be stuff that I've put in there myself, and of course all the commentary is from myself. So uh, that's going to be about it for the credits for Chapter 13. Let's go ahead and move on. So I'm going to start clicking through some of these slides, and I'm going to keep going because uh, I'll, I'll leave these up just for a moment if you want to pause, and then I'm going to keep going. So next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so uh, for chapter 13, as I said, we're going to be talking about solutions. Uh, so for solutions, a solution is when you have water, like a glass of water, for example, and you put something in it. And you could either put something in it that's covalent or something that's ionic. And if you're not familiar with those things, this is all from 1311. So like ionic would be like if you put salt in water. So, if, I mean, for whatever reason, if you wanted to take a glass of water and put salt in it, <clears throat> and if you mixed it up, then you'd have yourself a solution. Uh, same thing for sugar, but it's not the same thing exactly because when you put sugar in water and mix it up, you have uh, a covalent uh, compound. The sugar is covalent uh, and it's just dissolved in the water. Whereas with a uh, an ionic compound like uh, like salt then when you put it in the water <coughs> it's it breaks up <coughs> and you may recall this from 1311 so like if you put uh, iron if it's in its plus three oxidation state so if you put iron three chloride into water it's going to break up into four particles it's going to break up into the iron three plus and three chlorides so it isn't going to be the same process because with the iron or any ionic product uh, or substance, you're going to have it breaking up, whereas with a covalent substance, it won't break up. All right, so before we go any further here, let, let's just look these over. So uh, the basic definitions regarding solutions, that's, this is things like molarity, molality, and so forth. Rawls law, <clears throat> and there's actually two of them. And then these laws that have to do with colligative properties are these, yeah. Um, and then there's another one for osmosis. And then we'll just talk very briefly about colloids and suspensions and so forth. Um, you'll forgive me because I'm just waking up. So I'm still kind of out of it. Uh, anyway, so <clears throat> these basic definitions uh, we'll use for the rest of the semester. But these two things right here, I just wanted to mention actually these three things right here these three things that i'm drawing these lines around are going to be things that you'll have to learn for this chapter there, there's a danger with these three things in that we don't really use them again until the very end of the semester when we have the final exam uh, so uh, everything else that we do like starting with chapter 14 um, when we get to chapter 14 we're going to talk about kinetics and we'll use that for the rest of the chapter and then chapter 15 is equilibrium which we'll use for the rest of the chapter but this stuff that we learn in this chapter from number two down to four and i'm leaving out number five because it's not really something we're going to see that much but 
uh, will learn it and you'll have to learn it for your first exam. But then you'll want to keep kind of like during the semester, uh, you'll want to keep kind of like looking back at it occasionally just to remind yourself of it because it's the kind of thing that you're just going to completely forget about. And by the time you get to the final, if you don't go back through it, then you'll you'll just totally forget it and miss it. So uh, anyway, we'll see more about that in just a moment. So let's move on. So we're talking about solutions and solutions are things where you have a liquid and you put something in the liquid. Like we said before, like if you have a glass of water and you take a teaspoon of salt or half a teaspoon of salt and you put it into the water and stir it until it dissolves. It may not all dissolve, but as much of it as it can, as can dissolve, dissolves. It doesn't have to be, however, a solid and a liquid. It could be uh, another liquid could go into a liquid and then you'd still have yourself a solution. Or you could put a gas in a liquid, and the example of that that comes to mind is Coca-Cola or any kind of carbonated beverage or even uh, what's called carbonated water, uh, where you're just taking uh, carbon dioxide gas and dissolving it in water. But that's still called a solution. So we want to be careful here and realize that this is not a chemical reaction. Okay, so when you put, for example, carbon dioxide in water, well, it, in, in that particular case, it is a reaction. Uh, to some extent, because some of the carbon dioxide will react with the water, but most of it will just stay in the CO2 form. Uh, but basically what we're talking about here is the kind of thing that where we don't have a reaction. So like <clears throat> if you put sugar in water, it doesn't react with the water. It just dissolves. In other words, it spreads out in the water. Okay, next slide. So as we just said, it can be any number of different combinations. Uh, so when to make a solution, you can put a gas in another gas, or you can put a gas in a liquid, or another liquid in a liquid, or a solid in a liquid, or so forth. <clears throat> so we want to just look down here at the bottom. Uh, these definitions are very straightforward, so I'm not going to spend much time on them. The solution is like when you mix the salt in the water, the sugar in the water. That whole thing is called a solution. The thing that you mixed in, and where it, for example, if it were the salt or the sugar, would be called the solute. So the solute is the thing you mix in, and the solvent would be the water. It doesn't have to be water. It can be any liquid. About probably 80 or 90% of the time or more, when we talk about solvents in this class, we'll be talking about water. And also, uh, well, in most of your chemistry classes, because that's usually what we're going to be dissolving things in. But it can be something like carbon tetrachloride or something like that. Uh, so the solvent is the thing that is being dissolved in. And uh, <clears throat> if you have two liquids, then the one that you choose to be the solvent is the one that's present in the greater quantity. Okay, so let's look at some of these definitions very quickly. <clears throat> uh, here's some examples of... Uh, different kinds of solutions, which I'll let you look at this if you want. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, next slide. So first of all, here are the four definitions, and I'm not going to spend much time on these because they're very straightforward. So, and you've already had this first one in 1311, right? So at that time, if you took my class, I told you that we were going to talk about this one in 1311, and then that there were some other ones we'd get in, in 1412. So molarity is just to remind you is moles of solute per liter of solution, and that's a volume of solution, uh, which at the time we did it, it probably wasn't that uh, kind of thing that you really paid too much attention to, but now we'll have to because we have to compare and contrast that with molality. Uh, and it's, anyway, molarity is abbreviated with a capital M. Let's come all the way down here to the bottom to molality. So this is new. It's abbreviated with a lowercase m. And it starts off just like molarity. It's moles of solute on the top. But the bottom part is different. It's not liters of solution. It's kilograms of solvent. And it's going to turn out that we're actually going to use this molality in a lot of our uh, formulas or rules or definitions because <clears throat> it doesn't change with temperature, whereas molarity does. Uh, so molarity, if you change the temperature, it can change a little bit. So we use the molality in a lot of the formulas instead. Mass percent is just like, we actually did talk about this in 1311 a little bit, but mass percent is just um, like if you have five grams of carbon in a compound that weighs 20 grams, you just take the mass percent, it's just five divided by 20. 
that'll give you a decimal. In that case, it'll give you 0.2. And then you convert it to a percentage by just uh, making uh, percent and then multiplying by 100, so it'd be 20%. Uh, so there's not much to that. And then the mole fraction is kind of the same thing, except that you're doing it for moles and you don't multiply by 100%. So like, for example, if you've got two moles of A and a compound that has, uh, let's say, 10 moles total of A, B, and C, <clears throat> then the mole fraction of A would be 2 divided by 10, which is 0.2. Let's go on. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to get through these a little bit quickly because we have... Uh, kind of a lot in this chapter. So molarity, you already know, is moles of solute per liter of solution. So let's go to the next slide. So if you have one mole in 0.125 liters, so let's, I mean, I've done this like so many times for 1311. So if you took 1311 under me, you already know this, but I usually, unless there's some reason that I know that I don't have to do it, I usually just immediately convert these to liters. So we did that all the way through 1311. Uh, and I'll do it all the way through 1412. So I just am converting 125 milliliters to liters. And I know I'm going to need to do that because I know that the molarities here are going to be in moles per liter. And when I multiply moles per liter times liters, I get moles. <clears throat> all right, here, um, we're supposed to find the concentration of units and molarity. So if I have one mole of something in 0.125 liters, then the way I get the molarity, uh, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can do a ratio in proportion, but and so it's really hard for me, to, as you already know, if you've had my classes before, it's hard on these uh, presentations to write with this little marker. So, but so I won't do it very much. But uh, here I'm just going to do something that I'm I'm going to call a shortcut, where you just divide how many moles you have by how many liters you have. And I'm okay. I will write. L here. So, and ordinarily I would write that as 0 0.125 just to be clear, <clears throat> but just for the sake of time. So, one mole divided by 0 0.125 liters is how you could do this problem if you wanted to. You could also set up a ratio in proportion where you would say um, if you have one mole over draw a line and then put um, 0 0.125 liters equals x moles over one liter, and then cross multiply and, and solve for x you're going to get the same answer. So as long as you understand what you're doing here, you can do it this way and it's quicker. Just divide how many moles you have by how many liters you have, and then that will give you how many moles you would have in one liter. It just That's just how it works out. Um, so just be sure you understand it. If you do, then you can just go ahead and divide one by 0 0.125. 0 0.125 is 1 eighth. Let me, let me kind of move this out of the way here because this isn't part of the problem. So this equals what? So if you take your calculator and divide one by one eighth, you're going to get eight. So the concentration is eight. Let's go on. Okay, so this thing's not working too well. So uh, <clears throat> X is eight moles per liter and it's written as eight molar. And uh, you have actually three sig figs here. Again, I don't worry that much about sig figs, but you have three here and four here. When you multiply or divide, you want to keep the lower number, which here is going to be three. So to do it exactly right, you'd have to write it as 8.00. Not eight. <clears throat> okay, so 8.00 molar. Uh, so that's the answer. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, here's another example, which I'll probably just let you guys go ahead and do this. Because I know from experience that these things wind up being way longer than I intended. And I'd, I'm going to try to keep all of the lecture ones less than an hour and a half. Just because that's the maximum time that you can really sit there and look at it. Uh, so if you have 10 molar, well, that means that you've got 10 moles per liter. So how much of it would you have to have if you wanted to only have two moles? Well, okay, just think about it for a minute. I mean, and then you can do it written out if you want to. Uh, <clears throat> so, and I think that's actually done on the next slide. But... Uh, if you have one liter, then you're going to have 10 moles in this particular scenario. If you have one liter of it, which if you want to get a picture of that, if you're from the U.S., you, we don't use liters that much. So uh, the one thing that we do use liters for is like soda, uh, soda, uh, like Coca-Cola and that kind of thing. So those come in two liter bottles. And I'm not sure how that happened because that's the really off the top of my head it's the only thing i can think of that is measured in liters but if you want you can just think of a two liter 
a bottle of pop and then just cut that volume in half that's one liter but anyway so here if you had one liter it would have 10 moles of sugar you only want to have two moles of sugar which is what they're asking here then you'd only have to have one fifth of a liter I mean that's just something that's just common sense uh, so let's go to the next slide I don't want to spend a lot of time on this so uh, here's how you can do it longhand 10 moles per liter times X liters equals 2 moles and solve for X uh, so uh, I'll let you guys go ahead and do this one on your own let's move on okay consider separate solutions of NaOH and KCl now notice here these are ionic compounds okay so they're going to break up uh, when you put them in water now you wouldn't really what well, I mean you wouldn't know that unless you were really paying attention in 1311 but it, in 1311 we said that there are some things that when you put them in water they'll break up uh, and we said that those things included strong acids strong bases and some salts so remember that sodium hydroxide if you learned this you'll have to learn it in this class if you didn't in 1311 sodium hydroxide is one of the strong bases so it will break up in water so again just to remind you it's strong acids strong bases and some salts which we refer to as soluble salts and we'll learn all about that when we get to chapter 17b <clears throat> and it turns out that kcl is one of those soluble salts so we whenever we have things that like that are like that that we put into water we assume that they break up completely so anyway here we're assuming that this is going to break up completely uh, calculate the concentration of each solution in terms of molar molarity um, so uh, for NaOH if you have 40 grams per mole and KCl that is 75 grams per mole then all we're doing here is we're trying to see how many moles we're putting in to 250 milliliters of solution so remember from 1311 the way you figure out the number of moles is to divide how much you have by how much one mole weighs and to get the mole weight you would add up sodium's weight which is 23 here plus 16 for O plus 1 for H and that's a total of 40 okay so that's where they got that 40 right there and then the same thing for KCL so just look it up on the chart so how much do we have well for both of these we have 100 grams and then how much one mole weighs depends on whether you're doing it for NaOH or KCL so let's just do it for NaOH so for NaOH if we want to know how many moles we have in this 250 milliliters we would divide how much we have which is 250 uh, sorry which is 100 grams by how much one mole weighs which in this case it's actually a formula unit but it's but it's going to be divided by 40 so you divide 100 by 40 and that tells you how many moles you're going to have <clears throat> so 100, 100 divided by 40 would be uh, 2.5 moles of, and that's how many moles you're going to have of the NaOH to get the molarity <clears throat> which is another way of saying concentration so when they say concentration they're usually talking about molarity unless they say otherwise so you'll that's one of the things you'll want to just try to remember as we go forward anyway to get the concentration you divide how many moles you have by how many liters you have so just mentally convert that from 250 milliliters to 0.25 liters and then divide so let's go to the next slide and look at the answer this is going to be 0.25 liters or if you want to write it to 250 uh, liters next slide okay so for the first one uh, we had 2.5 moles and we divide that by the volume in liters so that would be 0.25 liters uh, again I just converted 250 milliliters to 2.25 liters here uh, so when you divide 2.5 by 0.25 you get 10 so the concentration for the NaOH is going to be 10 moles per liter uh, and then you do the KCL the same way so I'll leave that as an exercise to try to save a little time next slide uh, okay mass percent uh, is where as we said before you take the mass of whatever you're doing which in this case they're doing the solute 
over the mass of the solution. It doesn't have to be a uh, solute. It could be the mass of anything, but anyway. So you take the mass of whatever you're interested in finding the mass percent for, divided by the total mass. <clears throat> so what they're actually doing here is they're doing the mass percent of the solute. <clears throat> so they're taking the mass of the solute divided by the total mass of the solution. Next slide. So what is the percent by mass concentration of glucose? So this one's going to be the same type of problem. They want to know what is the mass percent of glucose in a solution of glucose water. So what you would do is find the mass of the glucose, and then you would divide it by the total mass of the solution, not the mass of the water, the mass of the whole thing. So that would be 5.5 divided by whatever you get when you add 5.5 .5 to 78.2, which is going to be like 83.7. So you would divide 5.5 .5 by 83.7, and that would give you a decimal, which is going to be like 120, so it's going to be like 0 0.05, which you would then convert to a percentage by multiplying by 100%. Next slide. I don't know if it's the humidity today or what. It's really humid today and rainy in College Station and so whenever I click to next slide it isn't doing anything anyway so it's taking a little longer so when we divide the 5.5 I'm, I'm down here like two-thirds of the way down we get actually it's 0 0.0657 and then to get it to a percentage uh, you move the decimal place over two places or multiply by 100 and add a percent sign so you get 6.57 percent and then I rounded it to 6.6%. So at this point, we're in 1412. I'm not going to say much more about sig figs. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, mole fraction is done the same way as mass percent, except that you just don't add the percent sign and multiply by 100. So if you had 2 moles of A and 10 moles total, as we said before, your mole fraction would be 0.2. So it's going to be a fraction. Uh, next slide. So here we have a solution of phosphoric acid made by dissolving 8 grams. Watch out here because you don't want to divide by 8 grams, okay, because this is not a mass percent. So when we did the mass percent, um, that was the last thing we did, the mass percents. Uh, when we did that, that's one of the few times we'll actually use grams. Most of the time for the problems in this class, we're going to be converting how many grams we have of something to the number of moles. And that's the case here. So to get the mole fraction, we have to find how many moles we have of the H3PO4. So what we do here is we're dissolving uh, <coughs> phosphoric acid, uh, we're dissolving H3PO4 in water. Uh, so we're dissolving 8 grams of H3PO4, but we don't want to divide by 8 grams, we, or divide in, 8 grams into this. We want to, or divide it by, divide into 8 grams, sorry. We want to divide it into the number of moles of H3PO4 we have. So to find how many moles we have of the phosphoric acid, we divide how much we have, which is 8 grams, by how much one mole weighs, which is 98 grams per mole. So divide 8 by 98. And whatever you get is going to be your number of moles. Uh, and then to get the mole fraction, you have to have the total number of moles. So that means the number of moles that you just got here plus the number of moles that you have with 100 milliliters of water. So <clears throat> to get the number of moles of water, you have to know the number of grams of water. And for all of these kinds of problems, we're going to assume that one milliliter of water weighs one gram. So if you didn't already know that, you might want to jot that down. <clears throat> So here we're going to assume that we have 100 grams of water. And water weighs 18 grams per mole, so we divide how much we have, which is 100 grams, by how much one mole weighs, which is 18. We're going to get a little more than 5, like 5.3 or something like that. So then we want to add the 5.3 or whatever it is, uh, moles of water, to the number of moles that we got for H3PO4, which is <clears throat> whatever you get when you divide 8 by 98. And so let's go to the next slide and look at the exact numbers. It takes me three or four times of clicking on that thing to get it to go. So uh, first of all, when we divide the 8 by the 98 here, we get 0 0.08163 moles of the H3PO4. And then when we divide the 100 grams of water by 18 grams per mole, we get about, actually it was 
so I said 5.3 so uh, <clears throat> it's 5.55 and then we add to that to that these two we add together to get the total and then divide the number of moles of the H3PO4 by the total so uh, when we add those together we get total 5.637 moles and then when we divide the 0.08 163 by 5.637 we get 0 0.01448 that's the mole fraction which to round it would be 0 0.0145 uh, next slide well this thing just does not want to go uh, all right <clears throat> I guess it's slow because it just woke up too uh, molality M is uh, as we said moles of solute and kilogram of solvent so be careful here because it's not the kilograms of solution all right so we're going to use this one a lot in this chapter because we're going to look at some formulas as we go along that are going to all use molality which is this lowercase m rather than molarity uh, so let's move on so here we have another example that's just like the one that we did but this time we're supposed to find the molality rather than the molarity so we'll start off the same way we'll find how many moles we have of the phosphoric acid the h3po4 and then instead of dividing it by the number of total uh of, instead of dividing it by the um <clears throat> actually what we did there was we did a, a mole fraction but so instead of dividing it by the total liters of solution we would divide it by how many kilograms we have of the solvent which in this case first of all the solvent is water <clears throat> that's what we're dissolving this stuff in and to find how many kilograms we have we start off by saying that 100 milliliters of water if we assume that water weighs one gram per milliliter it's going to be 100 grams of water and the only time we won't assume that is if they tell us in the problem statement that you know this the density of water at this temperature is blah 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 then we'll have to do that but that only happens in like one problem the whole semester one or two so you don't have to worry about that except when they tell you so uh, to get the molality we want to div divide the moles of solute which in this case is H3PO4 to get the moles of that you divide 8 by 98 as we did in the previous problem and then to get the kilograms of solvent not solution but solvent then you take the number of grams you have of the solvent which in this case is a hundred and you divide it by a thousand because one kilogram is a thousand or I mean in this case you can just look at it and you can see that 100 kilograms is 100 grams is 0 0.1 kilogram it's one tenth of a kilogram but if you can't see that <clears throat> like if you can't do that mentally you can just use your conversion factor so to do that you would multiply 100 grams times the fraction of uh, <clears throat> one kilogram over 1000 grams so I mean you would like here to the right of the 100 grams you would write a parentheses put in your conversion factor uh, draw a line and you'd put one kilogram on top in 1000 I'm not going to write it all out but because we we run out of time so quickly on these things uh, one kilogram on top and 1,000 grams on the bottom all right so let's move on to the next one took me three tries <sighs> okay uh, so we get the same number for moles of h3po4 here as we did in the previous problem and then we get the point one kilogram so we divide the number of moles of solute by the number of kilograms of solvent again don't do kilograms of solution it's not solution so that's confusing uh, so divide those two numbers and when you do that you get 0.8163 blah 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 which we're going to round to 0.816 molar and remember that lowercase m is mo molal m-o-l-a-l -L. next slide three times that time to get it to go uh, next slide all right forming solutions this is a theoretical part that uh, we do in this chapter that uh, never seems to wind up on the test so I mean I'll go through it but I'm going to go through it kind of quickly uh, so let's go to the next slide so basically what's going to happen here is we're going to say that a solution is made up <clears throat> of the solute and the solvent <clears throat> 
and when we mix them together we get the solution so they're going to do three steps here so first of all they're going to say that two things have to happen in order to make this solution first of all like let's take the example that we're doing sugar and water okay sugar and water then there are two things that have to be broken up to make the solution and when we say that what we mean is that we wind up with sugar and water where the sugars are all dissolved in the water in other words they're all spread out in the water uh, so first of all you have to break the sugar molecules apart and they're held together by what are called um, London dispersion forces as well as other things so the sugar molecules are kind of held together so you have to separate those I mean it's not going to take a ton of energy but you still have to do it and then the same thing for the water and the waters are held together by polar hydrogen bonds uh, so the hydrogen bonds are fairly strong so in order to put like for example a, a molecule of sugar between two uh, let's say molecules of water you have to separate the molecules of water but the molecules of water uh, have these forces that are holding them together and so it requires a certain amount of energy to break them up so that you can stick the sugar molecule in between them so both of those things that we just talked about involve uh, that we have to put energy into it to get it to happen but then once we've done that once we separate the sugar molecules from each other and the water molecules from each other then what's going to happen is that it'll make a solution and it turns out I mean and you'll want to remember this okay even though you may not see it exactly like this on a test uh, but you want to remember the basic principle here and that is that when you make a solution of sugar water or salt water the solution is more stable and a lot of this has to do with something we'll talk about later uh, in this class which is called entropy uh, so don't worry too much about that right now because we haven't gotten to it yet but uh, what happens is that it's more energetically favorable uh, to have a solution of sugar water than it is for, the, for you to have separated sugar and separated water in other words when you mix the water with the sugar it becomes lower in energy and that's the same thing as saying that it's more stable uh, so it will do that like spontaneously in other words you don't have to do anything to it uh, usually in in a case like that you wouldn't have to do anything to it I mean you might stir it up but uh, that's just to get it uh, started but it will dissolve spontaneously and once you uh, dissolve it it will stay in solution it won't drop back out unless you put in too much sugar if you just dump a ton of sugar in there then it's super saturated and it after you stop stirring it then some of the sugar will come back out but there will be a large amount of the sugar that will stay in, in suspension or in solution <clears throat> okay so let's review very quickly so we had to do three things basically or three things happened to make a solution of sugar water first of all we had to separate the sugar molecules from each other and then secondly we had to separate the water molecules from each other but then the third thing that happened happened kind of spontaneously or maybe we had to stir it up a little bit to get it going but uh, and that is that the sugar and the water made a solution and that ended up being more stable than the separated components so that means that it would actually give off energy and usually when you make a solution it and it depends on what you're trying to make a solution out of but a lot of the time when you make solutions and most of the solutions that we would make in everyday life uh, <clears throat> are energetically favorable which means they give off energy so think back through it we had to use energy to separate the sugars we had to use energy to separate the waters but then when we mixed them off mixed them up uh, energy was given off and actually it turns out that a lot more energy was given off than we had to put in to separate the two different components so what that means is that the net result is that the energy will go down and so the next discussion we're going to do is going to just be like detailing what I just said uh, and then it's also going to go through the other possibility and that is that uh, in some cases two things that don't want to mix together like oil and water when you try to mix them together they won't mix together and the reason is because uh, when you uh, separate them when you try to separate for example let's talk about dissolving oil and water like you would see in French dressing salad dressing uh, well again let's let's just start over and start from the beginning you'd have to separate the waters again which would require energy 
and you'd have to separate the oil molecules, which would also require energy because of the van der Waals forces between the oil molecules, the London forces. But then in that case, when you mix them together, you don't get that big release of energy because they don't particularly want to mix because oil and water have a different nature. Uh, oil is called hydrophilic, uh, hydrophobic, sorry, and water is called hydrophilic where water is something that likes to be with water or water related things and oil doesn't. So when you mix them together, you don't get that huge release of energy that you would get like if you mix salt with water or sugar with water uh, because it doesn't want to mix. So you won't get a solution. It won't spontaneously form because You've got to put energy into it to separate the oils, and then you have to put energy into it to separate the waters. And then you actually have to put energy into it as well for the third step, because that third step for oil and water doesn't happen spontaneously. So let's go to the next slide. So here's a picture of what we were just saying. Uh, so I am going to let you look at this on your own. What they're showing here <clears throat> is that here on top, for example, they're breaking up, let's say, the sugar or the salt. And here they're breaking up the water at the bottom. But when they put it together to make the solution, if it's like sugar water or salt water, something that's favorable, then it will give off energy. So let's go to the next slide. So the first two steps, it says at the bottom here, require energy, which remember we said that's endothermic. Step three is usually exothermic, or maybe we should say a lot of the time it's exothermic. Uh, all right, let's go to the next slide, I think. Uh, so the net result is that the sum of the enthalpies of the solution would have to be when you add together all of delta H1, 2, and 3, where the 1 would be breaking up the sugar, two would be breaking up the water, and three would be any energy that would be released when the solution forms. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll let you pause this here if you want to. I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, here's another picture of it that has the two scenarios that we've talked about. All right, so on the left here, over here, we've got a scenario where we have sugar water or salt water or something like that. So here, the two first things, the two delta H's, for breaking up the water or the salt or the sugar are positive because it requires energy. But then when you make the solution, it's more energetically favorable. And what I mean by that is the energy is lower for the solution down here. Notice this is energy on the y-axis. The higher you go up the y-axis, the higher the energy. So the solution or the product here is actually lower in energy here than when we started out. So that means that it's energetically favorable. That's what we mean by that. <clears throat> so there's so much energy given off when you make the solution in this case that it's more than compensates for the amount of energy we had to put in over here to break apart the water molecules and the sugar molecules. Whereas over here on the right-hand side, we have the opposite situation. Because what's happening over here is we have to put in an amount of energy to break up the waters and the oils. But then when we make the solution, it doesn't give off very much energy because notice here the energy of the solution in that case is higher than the energy that we started with down here. We started right here. <clears throat> so this is energetically unfavorable, right? So it won't happen. So the way we phrase that to try to be scientific about it is we say it's non-spontaneous. Uh, so over here on the left-hand side, we actually lose energy. Uh, energy is actually given off because we actually wind up with less energy than we started with. So the energy has to go somewhere, and it's usually given off in the form of heat. So we would say that this is an exothermic reaction, or not a reaction because it's not a reaction, but an exothermic uh, solution process. Or, uh, I guess that's the best way to say it, making a solution. <clears throat> and I'm not going to write out exothermic because it takes so long to write with this thing. So let's just write exo. Uh, and the delta H here, which I'll try to write that out real quick. Again, all of these lecture notes, I'm going to try to keep under an hour and a half, if possible, which some of them I already know it won't be. So delta H here is going to be negative. I wrote a negative sign right here. So that means 
it's exothermic. So if you didn't already know that, you'll want to either refresh your memory or just remember it now. Exothermic reactions have a negative delta H. Okay, now over here on the right, the delta H is positive. <clears throat> it's endothermic, so you'll want to remember that too. So endothermic reactions are positive delta H's. And what that means basically is you have to put heat or energy into it or enthalpy to get it to go forward. So in this case, remember we were talking about French dressing here. In this case over here, what you'd have to do is you'd have to take the bottle of French salad dressing and shake it up. And when you do that, you're putting the energy into it that's required to make it mix. But it isn't going to stay that way because the oil and the water don't want to be mixed. If you've ever gone to the gas station on a rainy day and maybe somebody had spilled a little bit of gasoline and <clears throat> when you look at the water where, where it's been raining, you can see like a rainbow on top of the water where the oil or the gasoline are floating on the water. And that's because the oil or gasoline won't mix with the water. So in here we're talking about French salad dressing. It's the same thing. So if you shake it up, you're putting in entropy or enthalpy into it. <clears throat> and there's a subtle difference between H and E, which we'll talk about in more detail in chapter 19. <clears throat> uh, but anyway, what happens here is that for the French dressing, they'll separate back out after you shake them up, they'll mix, and then you can put it on your salad like that. But then when you set the jar back down, what happens? Well, it re-separates out. Okay, so that's this situation over here on the right-hand side. That's what's happening over here. All right, so the side on the right is the French dressing, and the side on the left would be the sugar water. So this is exothermic on the left, and this is endothermic on the right. Let's move on. So uh, we can now explain why water and oil don't mix. It's because water is hydrophilic. It likes other water compounds. Oil is hydrophobic. It doesn't like them. Uh, so because water is polar, uh, it tends to like things that are polar. Uh, oil is nonpolar. <clears throat> it doesn't have any things in it that are polar because it's mostly hydrocarbons. Hydrogen and carbon have almost the same electronegativities, so they don't have any polar bonds particularly. They're a uh, very low polarity, so it's nonpolar. So oil likes to mix with other things that are like itself, <clears throat> which are called hydrophobic or nonpolar, whereas water likes to mix with things that are like it which would be things that are polar. So the scenario, in order to explain here, to give the answer, you could go back to the preceding slide that we just looked at and go to the scenario on the right and explain that the delta H when you make the solution is actually positive. So these things don't want to mix. Next slide. Uh, so look at this if you want. You can pause. I'm going to move on uh, and then move on again. And then again, this chart sums up what we just said, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. The top scenario here, this first thing at the top, is what we talked about mostly. And we wind up with a very large delta H overall, which means that you're going to make a solution. Um, for um, this third scenario down here, uh, the, so to go back to this first one, you wind up with a very large negative uh, delta H. And for some reason, they've got this is actually incorrect. This should be uh, negative here. The delta H of solution is actually going to be negative. And then down here, uh, I didn't notice this or I would have corrected it before we started this. Uh, this one could either be plus or minus. The difference here would be when you're trying to mix one nonpolar thing with another nonpolar thing. We didn't talk about this one. So this would be like if you're trying to mix hexane with heptane. And it will make a solution. And uh, so these delta H things that they have over here on the right-hand side for solution are actually wrong. And if you want to just review that, you can go back a couple of slides where we looked at the picture. The overall delta H of solution for this scenario was negative. Here, if you're trying to, and we didn't talk about this, but if you're trying to mix like hexane and heptane or heptane and octane, 
it could be that it's a little bit positive or it could also be negative. But in either case, you're mixing things that are like. Here you're mixing polar with polar. <coughs> Here you're mixing nonpolar with nonpolar. And so you're going to get a solution. And down here, I mean, up on top, you're going to get a solution anyway. On the bottom, even if the delta H is a little bit positive, which it may or may not be, <clears throat> you're still going to get a solution because of something called entropy. So it's important to look at both things in order to determine whether something's going to happen. Uh, and we can't really talk about that in detail until we get to chapter 19. Uh, because for some reason at HCC they don't teach entropy until you get to the second semester. But anyway, that's okay. But So we'll talk about that later. But because the solution here where I'm underlining is more random than the uh, separated components, then it will still make a solution. Whereas whenever you try to mix this nonpolar thing with this polar thing or vice versa, you don't get a solution at all. So you notice here that you don't get a solution here or here. <clears throat> so you may want to make this correction here in your slides. Next slide. Uh, and I'm going to let you look at this on your own, except just to say that you can use this rule, like dissolve like, like dissolves like, which means polar will dissolve polar and nonpolar will dissolve nonpolar. Next slide. So uh, things that can affect solubility would be things like structure pressure or temp effects. And structure is what we just talked about. So let's go ahead and move on to pressure. And pressure uh, would be like, for example, uh, if you're trying to dissolve a gas in a liquid, like in the case of making Coca-Cola or something like that, where you're trying to dissolve CO2 in water, in, in making carbonated water. <clears throat> so that would involve a situation where the higher the pressure is, the more of the gas will dissolve. <clears throat> And that's described by something called Henry's Law. And then the temperature effects uh, have to do with whether you get an increase in solubility when you heat up the water or whatever that, that you're trying to dissolve the stuff in. So it turns out that for liquids, it will usually, or if you're trying to dissolve a solid in a liquid, it will usually increase the solubility if you raise the temperature, whereas for gases, it usually decreases the solubility. Next slide. So structure effects, things can either be water hating or fearing, which would be things like oil versus hydrophilic, which would be things like water or alcohols. Uh, so, and we've already talked about that. That's actually what we just talked about. So let's go to the next slide. So pressure effects, we said that if we're trying to dissolve a gas in a liquid, like to make carbonated water, then it turns out that the way that you can get more of the gas to dissolve in the liquid is to increase the pressure of the gas above the liquid. So uh, I, I forget the exact number, but I think like, for example, for Coca-Cola and this sort of things, when they're bottling them, what they do is they put a cover over the top of the bottle after it's got the liquid syrup in it. <clears throat> And then they increase the pressure of the carbon dioxide above that to, I think it's 20 atmospheres. Uh, that may be too much, but anyway, to an amount that's significantly above uh, atmospheric pressure. And then they cap it with that pressure. So when you take the cap off, you hear that spewing sound because that's the pressure of the gas. And then every time you pour it out, I mean, the gas disappears, but then every time you pour some out and they put the cap back on it, <clears throat> then it will rebuild the pressure because the, the carbon dioxide in the liquid will come out of the liquid and make a new equilibrium. So there's a law that describes that called Henry's Law, which you don't really need to remember the name of it, but uh, it is that the concentration of the gas in the liquid, which we're writing as C here, would be equal. OK, well, it would first of all, it would be proportional to the pressure above it, where the P is the pressure of the gas, like CO2 gas, that is above the liquid. So we can always rewrite a proportionality as an equation if we put in a constant of proportionality, which in this case is called the Henry's Law constant. And it's just relating the concentration in moles per liter to the pressure in atmospheres. So the units of the constant have to deal with moles in liters in atmospheres. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, here's another slide showing what happens when we increase the pressure of the gas above the liquid. So notice here, at equilibrium originally, we have just as many molecules, let's say this is CO2, we have just as many molecules going into the solution 
as we do coming out. But if we increase the pressure of the gas initially, we're going to make, make it so that there are more gas molecules going into the liquid than there are coming out. Notice there's like one to three, four, five, six, seven, or eight of the ones going in and only two coming out. And then it will reestablish equilibrium over here on the right hand side. So again, we're back to the situation where we have just as many going in as out. So uh, they'll do that when they're making Coca-Cola, they'll cap it and then they'll increase the pressure like this until it reaches a certain value. And then they'll, they'll cap it and keep it at that pressure. And then it'll stay at that pressure until you buy it and take the cap off. Next slide. Temperature effects, as we said before, if you're trying to dissolve a solid in a liquid, for example, if you're trying to dissolve salt in water, sugar in water, then if you increase the temperature of the water, more of the solid will dissolve. So like if you're trying to make sh uh, sugar tea, uh, sweet tea, uh, you're trying to dissolve sugar in tea. If you do the addition of the sugar while the tea is still hot, it will dissolve more easily than if you wait till it cools off or if you put it in the refrigerator and then try to put the sugar in. Uh, so the solubility of most solids will increase with temperature, whereas with gases, they typically go in the opposite direction. So uh, typically, if you're trying to put, for example, CO2 in a liquid soda, then you would want the temperature to be low. So to go back to our example of the Coca-Cola, what they typically do is they decrease the temperature of the syrup until it's almost at freezing, until just above freezing. And that allows more of the gas to dissolve. Next slide. So I'm going to go through a couple of pictures here to show you this. If you're trying to dissolve sugar in water, like right here, then notice that as you increase the temperature here across the x-axis, the solubility goes up. And that turns out to be the case for most solids and liquids, with a couple of exceptions that have to do with the particular structure of these things. But even those two things don't really go down very much. Next slide. Whereas for gases here, you see just the opposite, right? As you increase the temperature across the x-axis here, the solubility is going down. And that includes carbon dioxide, even though it isn't shown here. So again, that's why when they're trying to make like uh, orange carbonated beverages or, or whatever, that they'll decrease the temperature to allow more of it to dissolve. Next slide. All right, so we're at Rule's Law now. Raoult's law is a way that we can figure out what the pressure would be of a solution if we put something into it. And the rule is that whenever you have something that is like water, which we it has the, the characteristic that we refer to as volatility. So water and things like water, like ethyl alcohol, are volatile. Uh, benzene is like that too. In other words, what that means is they evaporate. And an example of that would be like if you have a glass of water and you drink most of the water, you leave just a little bit in the bottom of the glass and then you set it down and you forget about it for a day or two and you come back and the water's all evaporated. That's because water is volatile. If you leave it alone, it'll evaporate. Same thing if you wash out your clothes by hand, hang them up in the shower or whatever to dry or outside, and then you leave them for a day or so and they're dry. And the reason is because if you leave water alone, at some point, each of those molecules of water is going to get enough energy to leave the liquid state and go into the gas state, and they will. And in fact, air has a certain amount of water vapor in it all the time, depending on where you are. If you're in Houston, it usually has a lot of water vapor in it <clears throat> because water is volatile. So what Rolls law is, is just a, a rule that tells us how to figure out the vapor pressure of water if you've mixed something into it. And the rule is this. If you have pure water, it will have a certain volatility. Uh, and that volatility means that there are molecules of water coming off the surface of the water at any given time. And because they're, they're coming off as gas molecules, believe it or not, they actually exert a little bit of a pressure off the water. Now you can't like put your hand over a glass of water and feel that because it's so low, <clears throat> but nevertheless, it's there. And so, for example, at 25 degrees centigrade, there's a pressure of the water molecules that are escaping at room temperature off, off the surface of water, like in a glass of water, it's about 25 torr. <clears throat> Where a torr, if you remember from 1311, it takes 760 torr to make one atmosphere. So the pressure we feel around Houston is one atmosphere because we're at sea level, basically. Uh, so it would take 760 torr 
also referred to as 760 millimeters of mercury to make one atmosphere. So, <clears throat> um, anyway, what I'm saying here is that if you have a glass of water at room temperature, which is 25 degrees centigrade, uh, then it will have a vapor pressure and it will be about 24 uh, tor, or just as a rule of thumb, you can think of it as 25 degrees centigrade means about 25 tor. And that's the vapor pressure that's caused by the water molecules that are evaporating at any given moment. So to do Rolle's law, we have to realize that if I take salt or sugar, either one, and put it into that glass of water, then it will slow down the rate of evaporation because what's going to happen is that, first of all, the sugar or salt, uh, either formula units or the molecules, are going to impede or block the access of the water molecules to get to the surface. And then also both sugar, which is polar, and also salt, which breaks up into two ions, a plus ion and a negative ion, are going to attract electrically attract the water molecules because the water molecules have partial negatives on the O's and partial positives on the H's. So what's going to happen is that those particles that you dumped into the water will slow down the rate of evaporation and that just means that the pressure will drop. So for example, if you drop, if I'm sorry, if you put some salt into some water, the pressure might drop from say 24 millimeters of mercury down to like say 15 millimeters of mercury. Uh, so the rule is that the more of the salt you, you add, the lower the pressure will go. And so Raoult's law is just a way of stating that. And so what it says is that the pressure of the solution will be the pressure that it would have been at that temperature of just the water by itself multiplied by the mole fraction of the water that's still there. For example, if you added 10 moles of salt to 90 moles of water, your mole fraction of water has now dropped from 100% originally, or 1, down to 0 0.9. So you're only going to have 0 0.9 the amount of vapor pressure that you would have had for pure water. So the formula is that the pressure of the solution is just the mole fraction of the water times what the mo sorry what the water's vapor pressure would have been initially <clears throat> at room temperature initially it would have been 25 millimeters of mercury but you'd have to convert that to atmospheres but <clears throat> or, well actually you wouldn't have to in that case but uh, well okay let's just leave it at 25 millimeters of mercury then if your mole fraction of water drops let's say to 0.8 then you multiply the 0.8 which is four fifths times the 25 roughly uh, you'd get about 20. So it would drop down to about 20 millimeters of mercury. Let's go ahead now and look at the formula here. Next slide. So here at the bottom is our formula that we're interested in. So it's what I just said. The pressure of the solution will be the mole fraction of the water or whatever the solvent is times the pure vapor pressure of the solvent if it were just that solvent with nothing in it. <clears throat> All right, so this thing right here is the Greek letter chi. It's the capital Greek letter chi. And that's what we use for mole fraction, as you may remember, for uh, from 1311. Uh, so you multiply the mole fraction, which is going to be any number between 0 and 1, times the original vapor pressure. So the vapor pressure will go down, as we said before. Next slide. Uh, so here's actually what would happen. If you just have the pure water, you're going to have the pure vapor pressure, whatever it is. For water at room temperature, it's about, I think, 24 millimeters of mercury. If you keep adding more and more of the solute, whatever that is, <clears throat> like sugar, then eventually you'll add enough that you've got uh, zero vapor pressure. Uh, or if, I mean, in other words, if you just had the pure solute, like, for example, if you just had pure salt, then the vapor pressure would be zero. So the more salt you add to water, as you increase the mole fraction of the water, then the vapor pressure of the solution is going to increase. <clears throat> so anything between these two points represents a solution. I mean, if you have uh, this situation over here on the right, you have pure water, and here you have pure salt. And, I mean, this isn't something that we're trying to teach at this particular point, but you can also deduce from this that if you have salt, it isn't going to evaporate, right? You can see that from this point 
here on the left hand side of this chart. And so what that tells you indirectly is that if you go to the ocean and you see that, okay, that's salt water, right? Because ocean water is salt water. And so when it evaporates, you might have asked the question to yourself, <clears throat> I wonder if the salt in the water evaporates too. Uh, and the answer is no, because you can see here that salt has zero volatility. So even though it's salt water in the ocean, when it evaporates, it's only the water that evaporates. So the salt is left behind. So if you didn't have rivers flowing into the ocean, then it would get more and more salty. And that's what has actually happened in the Great Salt Lake in Utah and also in the Dead Sea in Israel is because there, there's not enough water flowing into those, or in, in the case of the Great Salt Lake, it's probably basically no water flowing in at all. In the Dead Sea, there's actually a river that flows into it, but it doesn't replace the water fast enough that's evaporating, so the water gets really salty. Uh, so anyway, let's move on to the next slide. <clears throat> Now, if you have more than one thing that's volatile, like if you have a mixture of, um, let's say, benzene and water, uh, which I mean, you probably wouldn't, but if, let's just say you did, uh, <clears throat> then you use modified Rawls law, the modified Rawls law, where uh, you have to take both into account. So you have to take the pure vapor pressure of, let's say, the water, and then the, let's, let's change that to alcohol, like ethyl alcohol. So you would take the pure vapor pressure of the water and the pure vapor pressure of the alcohol. So uh, if you just had water and alcohol mixed, then the pressure of the whole thing would equal the pressure of the water plus the pressure of the alcohol. But when you start to dump some kind of a solute into it, then you have to do the same thing we did before. You have to take into account the fact that some of the water volatility and some of the ethanol volatility are gonna be blocked by those solutes. So you just do the same thing we did before. So like for the water, you do it the same way. You find the mole fraction of water, multiply it by its pure vapor pressure, but then you also have to do the same thing for the ethanol <clears throat> or whatever the other thing is. Next slide. Uh, and then this slide is showing you uh, three different possible ways that uh, you can have vapor pressures in solutions. If you have two uh, liquids in a solution, like we just said, like one possibility would be when you have like, for example, water with ethanol, then what's actually gonna happen is you're not gonna have a situation like the one on the left because the ethanols and the waters are gonna attract each other. <clears throat> and even if you don't put a solute in there, they're still gonna tend to hold each other down in solution. So the vapor pressure will be lower than we would have expected it to be, especially kind of like right in the middle where you have roughly equal amounts of one liquid and the other liquid. So this is going to be over here, which I would write, but it takes too long. This would be like water plus ethanol where you have two polar things. If you have two nonpolar things over here on the left, you've got a situation where they are almost the same. And so they don't really attract each other any more than they would ordinarily. And so you just have a straight line across here, which is what we call an ideal vapor pressure curve here. It just goes straight across. So this would be over here if you had just one of the nonpolar things. And this is what it would be if you just had the other nonpolar things. And then in between, it's just going to be like a straight line. On the other hand, if you have like water and oil, two things that don't like each other, then they tend to push each other out of the solution. So uh, the pressure will tend to be higher than we would have expected it to be. So the graph will be curved up like this. We call that a positive deviation. Next slide. So this is actually what I just said. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. And here's a chart that just shows what I said with some examples. So here we have the example of um, a positive deviation down here at the bottom where you have something that is polar, like ethanol, and something that's nonpolar. So they tend to push each other away from each other and out of the solution, which means that you have a positive deviation. Um, if you have two things that are polar, like acetone and water, uh, then they tend to attract each other, so you have a negative deviation. And if you have two things that are roughly the same in their structures, then they won't either push each other away or attract each other any more than they would themselves. So you have zero deviation, and we call this an ideal solution. Next slide. 
So for this example, they're asking us, will it be negative, positive, or ideal? So look at C first. Uh, C is hexane and octane. That's a six carbon versus an eight carbon. They're almost the same thing. Uh, and they're both uh, oils. So they will not really attract each other any more than they would themselves. So this is going to be an ideal. I'm just going to write I here for ideal. <clears throat> There's not going to be really much of a deviation. Uh, for ethyl alcohol and water, which is B, they're both polar, so they're going to hold each other down in the solution. So you're going to have a negative deviation. It's going to look like this. And for hexane, which is nonpolar, and chloroform, which is polar, <clears throat> you're going to have a positive deviation because they're going to push each other out of the solution. So the curve will look like this. Okay, next slide. And here are your answers. Next slide. Colligative properties. All right, colligative properties relate to what we just said. We've got a pure liquid and we put something in it to make a solution. So what that does is it changes things. And I mean, one of the things it changes, as we just said, is the vapor pressure. But as a result of that, it changes some other things. And there are actually three of them that we're going to talk about in detail. One of them is it changes the point at which it will boil or melt. That's actually two of them. And then the third one is that it will change what's called its osmotic pressure. Uh, so basically, a pure liquid like water has a particular boiling point and a particular melting point. So for water, the boiling point would be 100 degrees centigrade, right? And the melting point would be uh, zero degree centigrade. But when you put uh, something into the water to make it a solution, it lowers the vapor pressure, which causes the temperature at which it melts or boils to change. And it always goes this way. It causes the melting point to go down, never up. It always goes down for reasons we'll see in a moment. And it always causes, causes the boiling point to go up. And there's actually a formula that we can write for that. And that is that the change in the temperature of the boiling point of the freezing point, and they both have the same formula, but they have a different constant, equals IMK. And we're not going to talk about the I just yet, so don't worry about that yet. And then the M is what we were talking about at the beginning of class, uh, where we are saying that we're going to do uh, most of the formulas using molality rather than molarity. And then the constant will be different depending on if it's the freezing point or boiling point. So there's one constant for the freezing point and one for the boiling point for water or for any uh, liquid. So uh, the delta T will be I, which we don't talk about that yet. But I is just the number of particles that it breaks up into when you put it in the water. So, for example, for sodium chloride, it breaks up into... Na plus and Cl minus when you put it in water because sodium chloride is a soluble salt. <clears throat> so the I for <clears throat> sodium chloride would be 2 because it breaks up into two particles, whereas for sucrose or table sugar, it won't break up. It'll just be one particle, so I will just be 1. So what we're going to do at the beginning here is we're just going to assume that I is 1 for all of these, and then we'll talk about uh, other possibilities later on in the presentation. But the actual formula would be that the change in temperature will be the number of particles times the molality of the solution times the constant. And then once you figure out what the change in temperature is, if, it's, if you're dealing with a melting point, then you would subtract that from the original melting point, which for water, for example, would be zero degrees centigrade. All right, let's move on. Next slide. So colligative properties are properties that have to do with the fact that you've got a solution. And as we just said, it'll cause the boiling point to go up, it'll cause the freezing point to go down, and it will cause a change in the osmotic pressure. Next slide. All right, so here's our formula that we just wrote, except they left out the I, which they're going to actually put that in later. And I didn't do a very good job of writing that, but let's just try to make this into an I. So there's your I. And then, as we said, the delta T is the change in the boiling point or the freezing point. They're talking about boiling point here. So that would be the change in the boiling point. The constant is going to be given to you unless they tell you uh, uh, in a problem that you've got this new material that you don't know already what the constant is for that. And then they ask you to find it. But then they would have to give you the I and the M and the delta T, and then you can figure out what the K is. But most of the time, they won't do that. Most of the time, they'll give you the Ks. 
In fact, most of the time it'll be for water, and it's going to be the same every time. Uh, so you, if you want, you can just memorize them. Next slide. For freezing point, again, it's the same formula. It would actually be I, M, K. And this K will be different than the one that we had for the boiling point. Next slide. So we're going to do some of those problems in the word problem. So if you didn't quite catch what I was saying in those last two slides, or last few slides, <clears throat> you'll see it better when we get to the word problems. This slide is showing you a graph that will help you to understand what's happening that causes the boiling point always to go up and the freezing point always to go down. So the red lines here are the phase diagram for water, and this is uh, when it's pure water. And notice that if we start to add some kind of a solute to it to make it into a solution, then the whole graph moves kind of like down and to the left. And so what that does is it causes the boiling point to go up and the freezing point to go down. And you can see here, this is why it always goes only in that one direction. Uh, okay, let's go on to the next slide. So an example would be a solution is prepared by dissolving 25 grams of glucose in 200 grams of water. So originally, we had just the water. So the boiling point would have been 100, freezing would have been zero. Now we're adding 25 grams of glucose, which weighs 180 grams per mole. So what's the boiling point going to be? Now, boiling point formula is going to be delta. I'm not going to write it out, but delta T is going to be IM. K, and they're giving us the K right there. So there you go. So we know what K is, and we know what I is because glucose is a covalent compound, so it won't break up in water, so it's just going to stay as one particle. So the I will be 1, <clears throat> so we can just leave it out because we're multiplying by 1. So it's just going to be MK. So all we have to do is find lowercase m or molality, which is the moles of solute, which would be how much we have divided by how much one mole weighs, divided, divide 25 by 180, and that will give you the number of moles of solute, and that's going to be divided by kilograms of solvent, which in this case, 200 grams would be 0.2 kilograms. So we already know how many kilograms we have. We have 0.2. So all we have to do is divide 25 by 180 and divide it by 0.2 kilograms, and that will give us our answer, or it will give us our molality. And then we multiply that by K. Uh, so let's do that. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so we have 0.2 kilograms of water. <clears throat> For the molality, uh, let's see, up at the top, we divide the 25 by the 180, I mean, you can probably just ignore that 0.16, but anyway, you get 0.1387 moles of glucose. So we divide the number of moles by the number of kilograms there, and that will give us the molality. So uh, that would be 0.1387 moles divided by 0.2 kilograms, uh, which you can also do it as a ratio and proportion. Uh, it doesn't matter. Or you can just do it the way I'd, I'm doing it right there. And you get, anyway, when you divide the 0.1387 by 0.2, you get 0.694 molal. And it sounds just like molar, so I have to kind of say it slowly. Molal, M-O-L-A-L. -L. That's a lowercase m. So it's 0.694 molal. And then to get the delta T, we have to multiply that by the K, which was given in the problem statement as 0.51. So just multiply 0.694 by 0.51, and you get 0.354, and that's going to come out in degrees centigrade. That's the delta T. So since we're doing boil, were we doing boiling point here? Yeah. <clears throat> so the original boiling point would have been 100 degrees centigrade. So this is your delta T. This is your change in temperature, not your temperature. So just add that, because remember, boiling points always go up. Freezing points always go down. So add 0.354 degrees centigrade to 100, and you get your answer, which rounded off is 100.4 degrees centigrade. OK, let's go to the next slide. Three tries to get it to go. A plant cell has a natural concentration of 0.25 molal. <clears throat> you immerse it in an aqueous solution with a freezing point of this. Will it explode, shrivel, or do nothing? OK, so here, what they're doing is they're giving us delta T there. And the delta T would actually be without the minus sign because 
you automatically subtract these delta t's if it's the melting point. So the delta t's actually 0.246 degrees centigrade. <clears throat> and then the constant is for this one. Now notice this is not for water. This is for some solution here they're giving us. Uh, the constant is 1.323. Delta T equals IMK. Okay, in this case, we're going to assume that I is 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. So delta T, we'll just write MK. It just takes too long to write this. I could write this 10 times on the board. MK. Good grief. And then you can't read it when I do write it. So um, what we can do is we can use the delta T, which was given, and the K, which was given. So we're given this, and we're given the K, and rearrange this and solve for M. So we'll do that first of all, and then we'll compare the M that we get here with the M that we were given that the plant cell ordinarily had, and that'll give us our answer. So let's go to the next slide. So the molality of the solution, and that should be a lowercase m, which I didn't catch that because that, what happened is when I did this on PowerPoint, PowerPoint always has to try to do your thinking for you and correct you because they think you're wrong. So if you type that as a lowercase m, at the beginning of the line, they'll always change it. And if you forget to go back and change it back to the lowercase, it'll just stay that way. And that's what happened here. But that should be a lowercase m. So it should be molality of the solution. Anyway, it's going to be the delta T over the K, as we said in the previous slide. And so when you do that calculation, uh, you get 0.186 moles per kilogram or 0.186 mole. <clears throat> so because the cell's molality is higher than this, then what will happen is that water will go from the lower concentration to the higher concentration and it does that because it's trying to even out the concentrations till they're the same but what will happen is that when the water runs into the cell because cells in plants have cell walls it can only expand so much so once you put a certain amount of water in there it'll actually cause it to explode okay so the answer is that it's going to enter the cell and explode it so if you get this on a on a test you don't want to just write the answer so the question is, will the cell explode, shrivel, or do nothing? So if you got this as a short answer question on the test and you just write, it will explode, well, you've got a 50-50 chance of guessing that. So if it were worth six points, I would only give you a maximum of three on that because <clears throat> you got the right answer. But what I care about isn't so much that. Is I care about seeing if you know how to actually do the problem. So uh, that's the main part of the problem is, is to actually work it out. Next slide. Osmosis is the same thing. It's another colligative property, and we actually just talked about it. So uh, it just means that uh, whenever a solution has a certain concentration, <clears throat> if you put it uh, in contact with another solution, then the one that is more concentrated will accept water or whatever the solvent is from the one that's less concentrated. So let's actually look at that next. So uh, for... Um, Let's see. This particular topic, we have a formula from chemistry and from physics. You don't have to know the one from physics. The reason I'm putting it in here is so that if you take physics, you won't get confused. So for chemistry, we use this formula, and this is the one that you'll need to know for your problems. <clears throat> and that is that the osmotic pressure, which is abbreviated as this capital pi here, right here <clears throat> equals the molarity of the solution times the R gas constant, which is in this case, it's the one that's the 0.082 one times the absolute temperature. So for example, if you knew the pi and you knew the temperature, you could figure out what is the molarity, which is exactly what we're gonna have to do in one of our work problems. So for osmotic pressure, <clears throat> And we'll look at a picture of this in a minute. It isn't actually a pressure. And I'm going to wait till we get to the picture because it's easier for you to see at that point. Uh, and so let's just look at this formula really quickly. This actually should be I MRT, again, because the I is the number of particles. But again, at the beginning here, we're talking about just things that have an I of 1. <clears throat> so um, let's go ahead and go on to the next slide, I think, because I want to go ahead and talk about some other things about this.
So, okay, for this derivation here, I'm not going to go through it. If you want to look at it on your own, you can. What I'm doing is I'm starting with the ideal gas law here, and I'm just doing some rearranging and replacing, and I end up with the expression that we had on the previous slide. So you can look at this if, if you want on your own. Otherwise, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so uh, this one is one I wanted to get to. Osmotic pressure is not necessarily a, a pressure as we usually think of pressure, like vapor pressure, but it is the pressure that you would have to exert on something to keep it from raising up. And you'll see that better on the next slide. Well, it's actually after this, but we'll get back to that. Okay, so uh, I said that we would also look at the formula from physics for osmotic pressure, and this is just for your information. So if you take physics, they usually give you this formula instead. Well, they're both the same thing. We're going to see this again when we get to electricity uh, and electrochemistry. We're, we're going to have two different ways of looking at things, one in chemistry and one in physics. And it's not that they're different, it's just two different ways of, of looking at it. So here, the rho here would be the density of the solution. G would be the uh, acceleration due to gravity, and H is the height difference between the two columns, which you don't know what that is, but we'll see that. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, here we're at the slide I was trying to get to. So notice here that when we have a situation like this, we have a U-tube shaped glass <clears throat> and we have different things on different sides of a membrane that will allow water to go through, but it won't allow these different, like, uh, blue and green things to go through. Um, let's see. It won't allow the green things to go through anyway. I'm not sure about the blue things. Yeah, I guess it... Okay, so it'll allow the water to go through, and it'll also allow the blue things to go through, but it won't allow the green things to go through. Okay, so what's going to happen anyway is that when you have the situation on the left, it isn't stable. It's not at equilibrium because the uh, ions here want to be spread out evenly over this whole thing. And so the way that they'll do that is that the water, and it looks like also these little blue spheres, will start to go from left to right to try to even out the concentration of the green things and the blue things. So because the blue things can move across that membrane, that means that they're going to move across until the concentration is equal on both sides. But because the green things can't move, then what will happen is that the water will try to move from left to right until the concentration of the green things is the same on the right as it is on the left. But it can't because there's no way for the concentration on the left to get any bigger than it already is. It's zero. And it can't get bigger because the green things are too big to go through that membrane. So what's going to happen is the water is just going to keep going and going and going as long as it can. And at some point it will have to stop because what's going to happen is that the force that's exerted by gravity on this column on the right will actually equal the amount of pressure that's exerted by the water. So the way that we say that uh, is that in order to keep this from happening at all, if you wanted to put your hand right there to try to block the right-hand side column from going up at all, then the amount of pressure you'd have to put on that water to keep it from moving would be the osmotic pressure. So again, we go back to what we said before, that the osmotic pressure really isn't a pressure at all. It's just the pressure you would have to exert to keep it from moving. So the way that we do this in chemistry is that we say that the pressure or the osmotic pressure would be the molarity times the gas constant 0.082 times the absolute temperature. In physics, they call it rho GH, where rho would be the density of your solution. Uh, G is the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. And then H would be the height difference right here. Okay, so if you want, you can just forget the physics part until you take physics if you do. Next slide. And we've already talked about this, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so here's the typical problem. 33.4 uh, milligrams of a compound. Be careful here. W what you might want to do is when you see something like that, you might want to make a note or either just immediately go ahead and convert it to grams uh, if you think you're going to have to convert it to grams. Because if you don't, sometimes what will happen is you'll do the problem where you're thinking that's 33.4 grams and you'll have to realize at the end that you did it wrong. You'll have to start all over again. 
anyway and that's typical of things like uh, not only milligrams but also like temperatures that are given in degree centigrade where you're going to have to convert to kelvin and that kind of thing all right it's dissolved in 10 milliliters of water at 25 degrees centigrade and it has an osmotic pressure of 558 torr so we're going to have to convert the torr to atmospheres because this formula that i'm writing right now is assuming that your pressure is going to be in atmospheres so that p right there is going to be in atmospheres and it equals moles per liter times r which is the 0.0821 times the absolute temperature the 0821 is liter atmospheres per mole k and i don't usually write those out let's let's uh, go ahead and do this now so we know the temperature it was given in degree centigrade we'll convert that to kelvin um, and we know r it's 0.082 liter atmospheres per mole k and then we have uh, pressure in a tor which we can convert to atmospheres by dividing 558 by 760 and that will give us our pressure in atmospheres so we can figure out what that is so what we can figure out is the moles per liter moles of solute per liter of solution uh, so that's what we'll do to start and the way we'll do it will be to take this 558 number here and divide by 760 to get our pressure here in atmospheres and then divide by 0.082 liter atmospheres per mole k and then divide by 298 kelvin where i've added 25 to 273 to get the 298 and then once we've done that we'll have the moles of solute per and that's this compound here per liter of solution so there's a certain way that you do these problems and that is you take a certain volume usually although it could be a certain mass <clears throat> and you find uh, how many moles are in that volume and you find how many grams are in that same volume so when you do that then you just divide how many grams are in that volume by how many uh, moles are in that volume and that will give you the molar mass so what they're wanting us to find is the molar mass and that's like for example water is 18 grams per mole right so they want us to do that for this uh, compound here so what we just discussed was figuring out the moles per liter so in other words what we can figure out by doing what I just said which we'll see it in the answer in the next slide uh, but we're just going to divide the pi here in atmospheres by R and T <coughs> that will give us the moles per liter <clears throat> that will tell us how many moles <clears throat> we would have of this compound if we had one liter of solution and then what we can do is we can say okay but also in 10 milliliters of that which is one one hundredth of a liter we had 33.4 milligrams which is 0 0.0334 grams so I would just immediately convert that to grams so move the decimal back three places <clears throat> to the left and you get 0 0.0334 grams which you had in 10 milliliters but if you multiply that by 100 you'll have how many grams you have in 1000 milliliters or one liter and then you'd know how many grams are in one liter and you'd also know how many moles are in one liter because you figured that out here so let's go ahead and go to the next slide two times to get it to go that time so when we divided the 558 by 760 we got 0.734 atmospheres and when we divided that by r and then divided it by t we got the molarity which is 0 0.03 moles per liter and then we started with the number of grams of the compound which was 0.033 which i didn't actually do it that way but what i did was i figured out how many milligrams there would be in one liter and then converted that to grams but you're going to get the same number if you first of all convert this to 0 0.0334 grams and then multiply that by 100 you're still going to get the same answer which is 3.34 grams so here we know that in one liter of water we have 3.34 grams we also have 0 0.03 moles so we know how many grams are in one liter we know how many moles are in one liter so if we divide the number of grams by the number of moles <clears throat> that will give us the grams per mole which will be the molar mass which is one 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 grams per mole okay so let's go to the next slide and here we go try it a second time all right so the van hoff factor is just how many particles these things break up into when you put them in water so we've already talked about this if you put glucose or sucrose in water your eye is going to be one uh, and everything that we've done up to this point has basically been that way so 
The reason that they don't break up is because they're covalent compounds and they don't break up in water. Ionic compounds like NaCl or CaCl2 break up in uh, in some cases, not always, because there are also some salts that do not break up, which we call insoluble salts. They they break up, but just very, very small amounts of them will break up. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about those in 17b. So for right now, everything that we talk about as far as a salt is concerned, we're going to just use things that do break up that are called soluble salts. <clears throat> so the I number, for example, NaCl is one of those, and CaCl2 is another one. So for NaCl, I would be 2 because it breaks up into two particles. For CaCl2, I would be 3. Okay, so we really should have been putting the I in that formula for uh, osmotic pressure and also for the formulas for the delta Ts. And I actually did that at the beginning, just to kind of like uh, anticipate that. Let's go to the next slide. So this is just telling you what I just said. If you put NaCl, <coughs> excuse me, in water, it'll break up into Na plus and Cl minus. All of them will break up. So basically your I would be two because you're gonna basically have two particles for every NaCl you put in. Now they're gonna talk here just, uh, and I'm not gonna spend any time on this, but actually they won't all break up because at any given time, a couple of them may be stuck together. So if you really wanna know the exact number, instead of being two, it might be like, if you look, you can look this up in a chart where you can get the actual I and it's like maybe 1.98 or something like that, but we're not gonna worry about that. We're just gonna say it's two. Next slide. So for NaCl, for example, it would be two. For KNO3, it will be two. The NO3 won't break up because it's covalent. Uh, N and O are both nonmetals, so they make covalent bonds. Same thing for PO4. So the PO4 here won't break up. So you'll break up here, the Na3PO4 will break up into three Na's because those are ionic, but the PO4 part, <coughs> excuse me, won't break up. So it would be one, two, three, four particles that it'll break up into. Next slide. Uh, the actual Van Hoff factor we're not going to worry about, uh, but as I said before, for example, for uh, NaCl, it's actually supposed to be 1.865. We're not even going to worry about that, so we're just going to say that when you put NaCl in water, it's going to break up into two particles. Next. <clears throat> Ion pairing uh, is, is, again, we don't really need to worry about this. Just basically what they're saying is that the more of the NaCl you dump into some water, then the more likely it's going to be that one of the NAs and one of the CLs are going to stick together. Uh, it, it does happen to some extent, but it's it's such a small factor we're going to ignore it. Next slide. So what they're saying here is what we've actually been doing all along. They're saying that instead of pi equals MRT, it should be pi equals IMRT. And instead of delta T being MK, it should be delta T is IMK. But since I started you off by putting the I in there, then we already know that. So let's move on to the next slide. <clears throat> All right, so these next couple of slides here, I think there's a few of them, are going to talk about colloids, suspensions, and solutions. So I'm going to go through these and just quickly read them, and then you can pause and read it in more detail if you want. Solutions are what we've been talking about there. Uh, like if you put NaCl in water, they're transparent. If you put a light through them, like a flashlight, and you shine it through there, you won't see any scattering or anything. It's homogenous, you can't see any particles in there, and they don't settle out. Now, if they do settle out, it's because you put too much salt or whatever in there. But <clears throat> the, there will be a certain amount of salt that won't settle out, and you can't filter them. Okay, now, compare a s solution, and they're just giving you this so you won't get them confused. Actually, I did this, uh, so you won't, you won't get these things confused. A suspension is not the same thing. Uh, so an example of a suspension would be like, uh, if you put sand in water and shake it up, then what will happen is that the sand will, uh, for a, a few seconds, will float around in the water just because of the kinetic activity. But then it will just settle right back out again. So a suspension uh, is cloudy like the sandy water, and it's heterogeneous because you can see the sand particles in there. The particles are fairly large, and if you wanted to, you could make a suspension of sand and water and then filter out the sand. Or you can just let it stand, and the particles will e eventually separate out. Next slide. A colloid um, would be something like milk, which is intermediate between a solution and a suspension. 
So uh, no, I'm just going to read this. While a, sus a suspension will separate out, as we saw in the previous slide, a colloid will not. Uh, so like if you put milk in the refrigerator, it won't settle out where the solid part of it settles out from the liquid. <clears throat> Colloids can be, be distinguished from solutions, though, by using the thing that we talked about before we shine a flashlight through it. If you shine a flashlight through a solution, you won't see anything. But if you shine a flashlight through a colloid, you'll see like a, like a smoke. And that's all we need to say about these. So just for these last few slides, just be aware of the definitions because they could show up on a multiple choice question on the test. Next slide. And then this is talking about some things that you can read about on your own. The Tyndale effect is just the scattering of light in colloids by a flashlight or whatever. Next slide. <clears throat> Here are some examples of colloids. If you want to look at these, you can pause. And that's it. So that wraps up chapter 13. Uh, so again, the, the caveat for this chapter is that we won't use some of this stuff again until you actually take the final. Then they will be on the final because the final's cumulative. So uh, what I recommend again is that you go back over these periodically through the semester. Just, I mean, you know, maybe once a week, just kind of refresh your memory. What, what is the formula for delta T for, you know, either the freezing point or the boiling point, or what's the formula for... Uh, osmotic pressure, because uh, again, and also Henry's Law. All right, so let's stop here, and I'll see you in the work problems for Chapter 13.